This is going to be the first part of a two-part series. I believe it will only be two parts. I'm just going to scooch you a little closer. And it's a doozy. I was researching it the other day when Sean came home for lunch, and I was just typing, typing away, and I was telling him about it, and he just, like, his eyes just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, So, for the two of you that said yes, here you go. We are going to talk tonight about Joan Robinson Hill and her husband, John Hill. Like I said, this is part one, so get some snacks, because we got a long way to go. Joan Olive Robinson was born February 6th. She was adopted as a baby by a millionaire oil man named Ash Robinson and his wife, Rhea. There were rumors, never proven, that he had gotten his secretary pregnant or possibly paid someone else, a young woman, to have his baby, and that he talked Rhea who was unable to have children of her own into adopting the baby girl, but never matter any of that, despite those circumstances. Both parents doted on their beautiful daughter, and she wanted for nothing. She expressed an interest in horses at a very young age, and she was taking riding lessons by age three. She won her first blue ribbon at age five. Within a few years, she was an accomplished equestrian, winning first prize in horse shows throughout the country. After high school, she attended Stevens College in Columbia, Missouri. social life was nothing short of spectacular. She had blossomed into a real beauty, and there were rumors that an MGM talent scout saw her in a theater production, and she was offered a screen test. But her daddy, Ash, would have none of it, believing that predatory men in Hollywood would take advantage of his innocent young daughter. Shortly thereafter, she married a Navy pilot called Spike Benton, but this marriage lasted no more than six months. Following her divorce, she immediately married a man named Cecil Burgess. He was a New Orleans lawyer. She had known him since childhood. Within six months, Ash did not approve of either of her husbands, and a lot of people blame him for the breakups of his mar- his daughter's marriages. I find it funny that he would allow her to marry them in the first place if he was as strict and involved as 
asking Joan, how do you feel? Several times, Joan only nodded, but at one point said, Mother, I am blind. I cannot see you. Mrs. Robinson turned to her son-in-law and said, Did you hear that? What does it mean? Because he's a doctor, you know. She's having a blackout, said John. He did not seem at all concerned. He repeated his previous statement that the hospital was alerted that they were coming and that emergency facilities were geared up to receive Joan. But when the car eased into the driveway at the front of Sharpstown Hospital, no team of emergency medical personnel rushed out to admit Joan Hill. In fact, no one seemed to know that she was coming at all. John Hill got out of the car and went inside. His mother-in-law sat for what seemed like several minutes, waiting for someone to help her daughter. Finally, John appeared with a nurse who was pushing a wheelchair. Joan sat up in the back seat of the car, gasping for breath, while her mother pleaded, Oh God, hurry! Joan was lifted carefully and put into the wheelchair and pushed inside. Mrs. Robinson would later learn that the hospital, in fact, had no emergency room facilities at this time and no intensive care unit at all. The modest suburban hospital was, as one doctor described it in 1969, a good place to have a baby or get a broken arm fixed, but little else. Joan was taken to a private room where nurses descended on her for the admitting process. Mrs. Robinson was asked to leave, and she did standing helplessly in the corridor for more than an hour. John seemed to have vanished as well, and Mrs. Robinson could find no one who would tell her anything. Earlier that morning, John had telephoned a physician named Dr. Walter Bertineau.
surgeon had told his mother-in-law and the maid. The first nurse to attend Joan in her hospital bed took Joan's blood pressure, and she, she was quite startled to discover that it was 60 over 40, which is really, really low. The nurse was so concerned by this that she took it again, wondering if the blood pressure cuff was malfunctioning. And once more, it read the same, 60 over 40. They made an emergency call to Dr. Bertineau, who at that moment was a block away in a small professional medical building adjacent to the hospital. He dropped everything and went over there. He canceled out his whole schedule. When he first encountered Joan Hill, she was sitting up in bed. She seemed flush and short of breath, but did not appear to be a woman in shock. But she had to be in shock with a blood pressure of 60 over 40. In fact, Joan greeted Dr. Burtono by his first name and even smiled at him. This was all really strange. Doctor ordered IV fluids started in an attempt to build up the blood volume and raise her blood pressure. The danger here was that the patient could be thrown into terminal shock unless the blood volume was restored. And Dr. Bergno did not want to be responsible for the death of Joan Hill. So the nurses started the IVs and Dr. Bergno methodically took Joan's medical history, concentrating on the previous few days. He learned that she'd been vomiting, suffering from diarrhea, complaining of general nausea and malaise, so tiredness. He made a snap judgment that he was dealing with some kind of food poisoning. Now, routinely, Dr. Bertineau ordered urinalysis and stool cultures for if Joan had eaten something that he precipitated food poisoning, it could be determined by studying her feces to see if threatening bacteria were at work there. At th this point, the condition of Joan did not alarm him because food poisoning is a pretty common reason for an admission to the hospital. But other factors intrigued him. Why did she seem so rational when her blood pressure indicated that she was in deep shock? Confounded, Dr. Bertineau summoned a colleague, a Dr. Frank Lanza, in consultation. Dr. Lanza was a flashy young doctor who had once been a professional dancer, and he performed a nightclub act to help his way through medical school. Good on him. He was two years out of his residency in 1969, and although well-trained, he was not considered one of Houston's most famous diagnosticians. Before many more days passed, Questions would begin to arise as to why John Hill employed two doctors of lesser stature um, to treat his wife rather than engage physicians of world rank that were just across the city. Midday, February 18th, 1969, John was in the operating room at Sharpstown where he worked. This is why he took her there. He apparently reportedly passed another hospital in order to take her to this one that had no emergency facilities, but okay. He was performing an operation for his car removal, and he was listening to classical music. Despite the IV fluids that were being dumped into her veins, Joan's blood pressure remained low. 
for April.